All right, good morning. Morning all. Yes. So we are on the home stretch. This is week eight. And uh, from the draft timetable, the exam is for the 10th of May, right? Which means we just have short of six weeks, Miss Caroline. Short of six weeks to the beginning. Um, no, that would be how much that's just about. To the beginning of exams, it's six, about six weeks. To the beginning of the exam, so, so we just got up less than two months. Right, we got less than two months. There's not really not a lot of time. So I urge you to. Keep your momentum going. So what we are going to be doing from today and on, in fact, there's one topic I wanted, just put them there. It's one topic I want to go through, uh, which is managerial ethics and corporate social, corporate social responsibility, which is that I'm, I'm doing it for a reason, right? So this is the last topic I will touch on. And we'll do this for the first hour, and then we're actually going to start doing our revision. So some of your colleagues had indicated they wanted me to go back through the matrices. So I have a sample of the grand strategy matrix. We are going to go through the grand strategy matrix. And uh, this is ex ex actually a, an exam example that I have from one of the past papers. I think it was 2016. So we're going to go through this paper. Updates and available. I want you to analyze it and you will indicate to me how you would go about answering a question, um, this particular question. So let's go through managerial ethics and corporate, corporate social responsibility. So what is ethics? Anybody can tell me what is ethics all about? Right, correct. Your moral decisions and your decisions about how you perceive what is right and what is wrong. Right? But as we know, people are different and different value systems and different moral positions. Sometimes it gets all mixed up. So in the case of drug lords, like what happened in Jamaica with the guy Dadas, he's a drug lord but very wealthy, so he would support villages you know, pay for the health care for old people, fix people's houses, fix roads, send the children to school, give them food. So the community started to protect him because he was helping and they would say he's not a bad guy. But he basically was a drug lord and he was breaking the law. But the reality is, folks, is that for the people of the community, they began to see him as a hero, which is paradoxical. Right? He is a hero. Um, so you talk, you talk about people having uh, what we call ethical dilemmas, that a drug law is helping to feed children and take care of the health of all people, yes, he's doing something good, but does it make him necessarily a good citizen because he's helping poor people and helping children? But he's pushing drugs, which on the other hand might hurt thousands of people, people might die as a result of the drugs. Sorry? That's your thing. So that's what we call an ethical dilemma, that you're trying to make decisions of what is right or wrong, and I just say it's morally based and values based. So we're saying here that ethics is about right and wrong. And people's different perspectives on what is right and what is wrong. Right? So your son wanted, had to get a kidney transplant. So you went downtown, you looked for vagrants, you murdered the vagrant, 
So okay, we got a dot tensor for KFO, we can be Liebherr zero sign. So I do argue Liebherr is not valid to society. Now somebody could argue that. Maybe watch John Q, I don't know if you all ever saw Denzel Washington's John Q, where I think his daughter needed to get heart transplant, and she was on a list of donors. Um, but she was read down the list, and she would die in a short period of time, so he made a decision, again, which is from his own morals, he is going to basically hold on the arms arrest, then in the hospital, took the doctors and nurses at gunpoint and forced them to do the transplant for somebody who had died who was to donate their organ because his position was, I have a moral responsibility to protect my daughter from harm. So that's what we call ethical dilemmas, you know, where people make their moral choices of what is wrong or right. So in the context now of a business, when people invest in a business and you get shareholders to donate millions of dollars, the ethical issues become much more important. But it's not only about you and your family and a few people, you could be talking about hundreds or thousands of other people who have invested their life earnings. That's what they could have done. They could have invested their life earnings in your business, but you determine that your own personal wealth is more important, so you actually steal money from the company to take care of your family and so that's the issue of CEOs and managers and people in financial institutions. When people deposit their monies with you or insurance companies, is there what kind of moral responsibility there is? Because the law is one thing, right? But people can break a law. I think it's the moral responsibility. So we'll give you some examples further down. Why this topic has become so important today, because as I said, you could have all the financial rules and the financial regulations and laws, but it doesn't stop somebody from stealing. You understand? You can put a law in place that if you break the law, you have 50 years in jail, but it doesn't stop you from stealing and being caught 10 years down the road. The issue would be millions of people might have been bankrupt and eventually you're sent to jail, but the point is you would have ruined the lives of millions of, of thousands and tens of thousands of people. So one of the reasons why it has become so important, and more so at the implementation stage, because you would realize, folks, we, are, we have finished the formulation stage, that is the formulation. So we are now into implementation, and we looked at implementation last week. So in terms of a running business, why is it that today, particularly, we are focusing a lot more on, on ethics in terms of businesses running and um, operating on a daily basis? So we're saying the breakdown of ethical conduct of senior managers. So what they have found, not only frontline staff stealing, but they have found in countries all over the world that you have very senior managers, CEOs, presidents, people on boards, actually concocting and conspiring to steal money, right? Which is a very serious thing to happen. And the second thing, time and productivity are stolen easily. So you go to work every day, and you look busy, but you're not really working, right? You understand what I'm saying? You go to work every day in the public sector, private sector, you look busy, presenteeism, right? I'm showing OB, Keanu and them, but they talked about that. So you have presenteeism, you are present, but you're really not doing much. You're looking busy, but you're doing as little as possible, right? And the other thing about it is the little petty stealing. So at work, your child wants a notebook, so you take him a notebook from the company. Your child needs a pen, you take up a pen from the company. Your child needs a pencil, you take up two pencils from the company. Your child needs a ruler, you take up a ruler from the company. You want copy paper, you take up copy paper from the company. Sorry? And you, of course, and people print. You have your project to be done, you go to work, and you print your project from the company. You want covers, if the company has covers, you also take the covers from the company. Oh, that's stealing, unless you get permission. <laughs> that's stealing. It ain't borrowing, it's not taking, it is stealing. So we got a lot of petty stealers all over the place. You understand? We have petty stealers all over the place. You understand? You work at a restaurant and you get an opportunity, you realize they got some nice steak, nice high premium steak, 
Nobody ain't watch it. You take away four and you carry home. And you start selling. And you start selling. That is stealing. You understand? You understand? It happens all every day. Every day it happens. Correct. But the company is at fault too. I agree. So the company is at fault. You can have good systems in place. But if the person, but even if you have a good inventory system, if the accountant colludes with managers and staff, the, the systems in place don't resolve the problem. So that's the point we're making. When senior managers are part of collusion in crime, you could have all the top-notch systems and security measures. In fact, you could even have cameras. But you know what happens? When you play by the camera, it is empty. Right? It is empty. I am, I'm serious, folks. I remember there was a situation at the university long, about 10 years or 10 years ago. The white person who was a big, big one to actually becoming popular. And the solution center that offers training at the training center, they brought in, I think, was huge. They wanted commercial one. I don't know if you have a or no. It was a very huge. Yeah, it's actually for showing for commercial purposes a massive white screen TV that, that told me a whole group of men had, had to be hoisted upstairs. And after a few months, it was stolen. <laughs> no, it was hoisted upstairs on a truck. And when they looked at these, and we got, you know, we got security all over. Well, we didn't have as much, but we still had security. So when the security cameras were checked, they saw a truck coming in. It was night too, you know, it was about 12 o'clock or something at night. They saw a truck coming in. They saw the truck turning in the direction of the solution center, but the, the, the cameras did not pick up the truck leaving. The video was empty when it came to the truck leaving. So you know what happened? I'm sure the video just did not stop when the truck was leaving, but if it was leaving, you would have seen the TV on top of the truck. So I'm saying, if you have collusion, people could actually go and just wipe the video. If there's collusion, because the, the video would have to be in a central spot. So the question is now, who would take ownership for it? Right. So folks, time and productivity are part of stealing, but we don't see it as that. But when you look at your company having hundreds of workers, and every day half of those workers steal time and productivity, it costs money. You know, we're talking about the value chain, and that's why it is important. It can become a cost to the company that you're not meeting your targets, you're not meeting your output levels. And ethical family values are disappearing. So this is where we go to the environmental business, and we're saying the social cultural element cannot not be considered. So that's why we're saying businesses, why businesses actually try to make contributions to schools, they try to mentor students, and they get students to come in their organization from time to time. Because where do employees come from? In society. They come out the school system, they come from families. So if there is a breakdown in family values, and suppose there's a very little value placed on stealing, when you hear people, they will steal and not think twice. They wouldn't think that they're doing anything wrong. Because that's the value system that they have become accustomed to, you see. Right? So, so that is an external factor that is important. And then organizational loyalty disappearing, and it's the WIFN. People are saying, what is it for me? So I have to get back something. So employees could conclude the organization, I think I deserve to be paid more. So since you're not paying me enough, if I take up paper, it's just the additional compensation because you really should be paying me more. So if I take up a couple of pens, if I print some stuff, if I steal a stick or two, you really should be paying me more, so I'm just taking what is rightfully mine. So people have convenient ethics that they try to rationalize the things um, that they do. And this is at all levels, folks. It is at all levels from the CEOs, general managers, supervisors, and frontline staff. So we're saying for business ethics, they are the principles that guide decisions in organizations, right? They are guide. So Suppose a company knows that you have a product that is not 100% quality, right? So you have some food, you know the food is not, there's a little problem with this food, but you realize 
But if I throw away this for you know it's going to cost me. So some people would take a chance, but let me sell it anyway. If a couple of people get diarrhea, at least they might not know if it is from me or somebody else that they ate at later. So people will sell things, products that are defective. You know they are defective, but you still sell them. Right? Yes, Yari. Makes me, yeah. Right. So people do all kinds of things. Folks, you'd be amazed what people do to make money. But the point we are saying here, it is all about corporate social responsibility, which is an ethical, a personal ethical issue. So if the president of a company doesn't have very high ethical values, that president will do anything to make money. And if profit is your only motive, man, you will like cheap steal, treat people badly. So the point we are making in terms of implementing strategy. This issue of corporate social responsibility and business ethics is becoming important because they say, you know, if you have a moral responsibility, because as Gary said, it's about morals. So today we are saying companies do not only have a re or boards and, and, the, and the managers, you do not only have a responsibility to make profits, but you have a moral responsibility to protect your staff and also protect society. Right? That's what we are talking about. Yes. Management is a written thought that your sole responsibility is to your investors and for a profit. Correct. All right. And, and so Gary is saying that years ago, we call it the Adam Smith economic theory. So Adam Smith was of the, the view that the first and main responsibility of the managers of a business and boards is to ensure they maximize the profits of the shareholders. Yeah. Um, especially in the company and economics, profit maximization theory. Correct. And, and formulas on how you maximize profit instead of maximizing efficiency. Correct. Productivity is raised instantly by happy workers. Happy yeah. workers are raised by good, affordable corporate. And how you treat people. In fact, yes, go ahead. You're saying? Right. Now, I don't know if you heard, I am hearing on the BBC and the World News today that some researchers and, and I'm journalists are finding in a number of the top bottled water companies, they're finding little particles of particular type of plastic in these. Yeah, they've been doing a, a, a analysis of a wide range of, of the popular or the most pristine brands and finding they're not really as clean as you think. Yeah. So the point that Gary mentioned just so folks is an important point, and that is if you have businesses that are still driven by the, ma pro the profit maximization approach, and you do not consider the ethical considerations, you can really treat both your staff who are people and your customers with a kind of a gross disrespect. So we're arguing then that good business ethics is really good strategic management that is not only about making profit, of course you want to have profit and returns for your shareholders, but at the same time, you want to treat your staff in such a way that they're not exposed to harm. So something as simple as folks, you, you do not clean your AC units frequently. You do not get your offices commercially clean and they have carpet. And you know in the tropics of the Caribbean, you know, we're not like the, that's the thing about us, we develop some organizational systems and structures for cold countries. So for some of those countries, they only have heat, heat for about three, four months of the year. But other than that, it is cold in winter. There's not a lot of dust. It's damp. So that's why they have a lot of carpet. But you've got companies and houses. Like for me, I, I, my, I, my houses that I had over the years, I don't use carpet. So we got dusty places like Barbados. And people got wall-to-wall -wall carpet. But if you're in a cold country, and you got people operating in these with AC units that are clean. So no wonder, folks, you have a lot of sick buildings, a lot of respiratory problems. But if you can have your carpet, you need to have it commercially clean very often. 
and you need to have your AC ducts because we are a dusty place. So you need to have your AC unit clean, so we don't. So I don't think it's by chance that Barbados has a very high rate of asthma or people having respiratory problems or allergies. So does an organization have a responsibility to make sure that you clean your offices um, properly on a regular basis and you make sure your ACs are serviced regularly. So the issue of mold, and mold can make you very, very ill. Right? Um, and that's a, something I'm hearing all over Barbados now. I am not sure about the other island, but this issue of mold. Right? Mold can be, a, it grows, so it can be a very dangerous thing. And why mold will come? Because we are one country and you've got ACs that part work. So it heats up and cools down. You see, so when you're all going rooms, and you're open, if it's too hot and you open the window, you really create an environment for mold. But it's cool, 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 and then you open it and it becomes warm. And then it's cool, 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 then it gets warm. So these mixing of, you ever, if I work in the hotel industry, you know what they tell us? Make sure if it is supposed to be cold, keep it cold. If it is supposed to be hot, keep it at the right heat temperature. But you don't be mixing coal and hot. If not, you're really dealing with food, what we call food contamination. So when you have offices, folks, that and these lecture rooms that hot and cold, it's too cold, you open the windows and it gets hot, and then it gets cold. So all, that's a, a, a really prime condition for a lot of the problems we are beginning to find at the university with mold starting to build and everything. So what is the code of business ethics? So it provides a basis for which um, policies can be devised to, devised to guide daily behavior and decisions at work. Um, so why do you think focusing on ethics might be more powerful than focusing on the law or company policies? Why do you think that might be more powerful than focusing on company policies than law? Mr. Alex, what do you think? Why is it better to focus on the ethical principles than on the law and company policies. You're getting warm. Yes, Gary. And you're correct, Gary. He's correct because if my ethical and my value system guides my daily behavior, nobody has to tell me to do it because it's my core value system. So if my core value system is it is wrong to steal, when I find something, I wouldn't take it up. You understand? If that's really my core value system, if my value system says, well, if I find it, there's no name in the wallet, I can keep it and it's okay, right? So what your core value system is determines how you respond to situations, right? And I'm, tre I'm stressing if it's your core value system. Not if you say that you don't think stealing is right, it's what is your core value system. So to give you an example, if when this lecture finishes today, right, Caroline finds a wallet, and this is Caroline right here. Caroline finds a wallet with 500 US dollars but there's no name, no ID, no form, just this wallet with 500 US dollar bills in it, crisp bills, and Caroline finds it, but everybody left, and it was just her staying back, she was doing something on the phone, and when she was walking out, she found it. What should Caroline do? What is, what is that? What is that? They said what? Keep it. Why keep it? Sorry? Yes. It is just as bad? How could it be just as bad? So you're saying because somebody stole it, it does something to you for doing the right thing? Because if somebody stole it, it doesn't, it doesn't deflate or reduce what you did. 
Sorry, yes, Alex. That what? <laughs> Somebody is saying U.S. cash is hard to find. <laughs> what would you do? Uh, a student, uh, folks, you see, but it's a serious thing, you know, because a, a student told me once, right? When I did this years ago, the student said, well, Dr. Corbin, if when I left, before I left home, I had prayed, and I said to God, God, I really got to pay my fees. God help me to pay my fees. And he should have said, if when I come in the room and I find it, I can say, God, thank you. <laughs> no, you're putting the blame on God. You're only human. But folks, but, but folks, I'm saying to you, now, your, value, your, true, your true value system, right, allows you to determine to do, right? But I can tell the position I have taken for years, and at my age, I've been doing it a while, right? I'm 60 years old. I'm about maybe twice or nearly three times the age of some of you. So, folks, this is what I do, right? If I find 10 cents somewhere near my office, I might take it up and put it on the wall. If I find a cent, I take it up and put it one side. I don't take anything like that I find. I'm serious. Don't care what part of the world I am. If it's a 10 cent, it's not mine. I just take it and I put it on top of the wall where somebody can see it. If I find five cent on the ground, folks, if I, even if I try to take it up, I feel bad. Huh? And I put it on the wall that somebody will see it. No, but the point I'm saying to you, folks, it is not mine. So I don't take it. <laughs> it is not mine, so I don't take it. Right? And that's the <laughs> Yes, Gary. That's an excellent example. Folks. Let me give you another example. You went to a cell phone business to buy a cell phone. The place is busy, 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 busy. And you are talking with the customer service rep that is excellent, and you're complimenting the person, and you're not having a nice conversation, but busy, busy. So the person is dealing with multiple people, but really excellent service person. And give you the phone because you all have this nice conversation. And give you the phone, package it off, and you are supposed to pay. But the rep, so caught up in dealing with the other customers, really nice, engaging, and get you to pay, and you leave and go home. And when you get home, you realize, wait, but I haven't paid for the phone. You will go back and pay?
So folks, if the form mash up, somebody could argue if it doesn't mash up. But the reason can't be before the form mash up, it might be more of you saying you're acknowledging the wreck might have to pay and you don't want the wreck to pay. But why do you think that? Why do you think it's not here to be actually paid? <coughs> So the same point is now with the five hundred dollars with no ID. What's the difference? What's the difference? Sorry? No, but folks, but what but it's something you can do in the first case, you know. You don't have to tell anybody anything. All you have to say is that the next class did anybody forget anything in the electric theater the day before. That's all you got to say. Did anybody forget anything? And that person who may pay the $500 is sure to come to you to tell you, because nobody else will know how much money it is. So I'm saying there's a way you can find out who did it, you see? Right? You see, so, so we, could argue in, we could argue in the scenario with the cell phone, the only reason why you would bring it back because they say it can be traced. <laughs> You give me it back. But why would you do that? Right, because you think it is wrong. She's saying that if the van person gives her more money, she would give back because that's your value system. But I can bet you there are a lot of people that if the van person gives them more money, they are not going to say anything. So folks, in fact, that's the point that Gary was making. When you focus on a value system, you don't have to worry about the law or policies because if the value system is strong, you will do the right thing. But if your value system is very low on folks, let's look at the real let's look at reality now, folks. The reality is this is the it. And IT has informed me. They, at the beginning of semester, had 15 cordless mics, and all 15 are gone. You know what I used to use a mic with a cord? They stole the first one. You know they stole the second one? That's why you don't have the mic. The first mic, somebody stole the cord. They've, they've got another cord. Why I don't have the mic today? Because somebody stole the cord from the second mic. Folks, you understand what I'm saying to you? So the question is, who is stealing the university's mics and equipment? Not only the students, I mean, it costs the university to run the institution. But it could also, it could be lecturers, two of them understanding lecturers, they have the mic spin on, they walk away and they go home and don't bring them back. But who is, the question is, somebody or people are stealing the equipment from the university. You, you understand? So it says about the value system of whoever is stealing, it surely can be that you want to, well, a situational ethics, you could argue, I have student fees, and if I can sell a mic to pay my fees, I can ask God forgive me later. But, so for, that's the point I mentioned, folks, about an ethical dilemma, right? And the ethical dilemma is choosing between what is right, not wrong, only right and wrong. You can see the right in it from this angle, and you can also see the right in it from the other angle. You, you understand? Right? So in other words, like the situation with John Q., he stuck up the doctors and nurses to force them to give his daughter a heart transplant. So you can see, if you were the authority, you can say they are right in saying you don't have the right to make this determination. Your daughter has to work right in line. You can see, because there are other people before her. So we can see why they are right. But you could also see for John Q, you could argue, some people might say, but he's right also, because his daughter could die, and he's wanting to make sure 
that his daughter lived. So some people ar could argue that is right and right, you see. So, sorry? Everybody? But for him, people who support him, so his family and all those might say he did a right thing because once the daughter is living, in fact, he was prepared to go to jail, you know, because he knew the daughter will live and he will go to jail. So he's prepared to say, I am prepared to go to jail, but my daughter will be living. So he's not considering the other people that were before. All he's saying, it is my daughter and I have a responsibility to ensure my daughter lives. And that's what situational ethics is about, folks, you know. In other words, you are in serious, in fact, that's how a lot of people run in trouble. You are in serious financial difficulty and the bailiff is supposed to come and seize your house. And you have a wife or you have a husband and three children, young children. Folks, I'm telling you, and I'm trying to look at both sides. Some people in the situation that will make a decision, might as well give me them that one. I'm sorry, I will make this decision. I hope I don't get caught. Some people are going to say, ethical dilemmas present themselves to people. And from time to time, we are faced with an ethical dilemma. Right, suppose I had the exam paper in my bag. <laughs> in fact, I had it in my bag this morning, I took it out. <laughs> so I had the exam paper in my bag, and I had it in this file, and I put it on this desk. And I opened the file to do something, and say, all right, look, I started to call, and I say, look, um, look come on, and just you know, make an adjustment, just turn off this computer for me. And he comes and he like, he says, wait, yo, exam. <laughs> and you all see him pause a bit, you know, and he start to like, and you all see him, he's standing up very long. But Dr. Carter, me tell you to turn off the computer. And you see him there so far, trying to tie these shoes and everything. <laughs> and you all wonder why is he taking so long? So he has a choice to turn it over or to... <laughs> It will be tempting, right? For, for a lot of you, it's going to be tempting. I'll just have to tell you the truth. It will be tempting, right? It will be tempting, for and you got a choice. Should I try to find ways that I can take up and, and pretend that, oh, yes, yeah, what's happening? All right, hold a bit, hold a bit. I can't hear you. But, all right, go ahead. And he has the exam. Yes. <laughs> a peep is a... A peep beats a study. <laughs> but again, the point we're making here, folks, is that your ethical system and value system will determine whether you refuse to study um, or peep <laughs> Or whether you determine, I really don't want to see this. This is not fair. Contact lenses of the future. And you blink. <laughs> but folks, in real life, we are all faced with these dilemmas from time to time to make a decision that other people might think is wrong. And I think the point we are stressing here, know when you are given the responsibility to run a business, and you have taken millions and millions of dollars of shareholders' investment, retired people, people who retired after working 40 years, and they put all of their life savings in your business to protect for you to be able to live until you die. When you have that responsibility, folks, you better have a very, very high moral compass. Because it's not only you and a few people around you you're hurting, you're going to be hurting tens of thousands of people. In fact, let me page forward and let's see the reality, folks. I don't know if you are, are aware of it. Yes, that is it. Are you familiar with the Enron case? Right, Enron, WorldCom, these were financial institutions that had tens or hundreds of thousands of people, a firm in the US, that had invested in this business. And a lot of the people were, re I mean, people who have retired and were living in really high-end retirement homes. You know, high-end retirement homes. But they were wealthy people. 
and they end up broke, and a lot of them ended up at 70 years old in Walmart packing goods. They were kicked out of the home because these people stole their money. They stole their money. I think one of the, I think one of the CEOs killed himself. A whole set of them ended up in jail. And that there was not only management, it was the board in collusion. You imagine, but the point is, thousands of old people who were in retirement home, who saved it to live a comfortable life in a home, ended up back at, you imagine at 70 something years, you back at Walmart packing goods after you were an accountant and a lawyer and all those kind of things, packing goods at 70 something years old. So a lot of them died, you know? They just, took, people had heart attacks, people killed themselves. I mean, it was really horrible. So folks were saying, Maybe going on for the question that Gary posed, if you are working for a business and you realize that somebody in the company is stealing money, right? You realize somebody in the company is stealing money and you picked it up, they're stealing millions, what would you do? Would you, would you be a whistleblower? Would you inform the auditor? Would you inform the police? What would you do or would you keep silent? You'll call Crane Stoppers. <laughs> so they went before the court and the basically a number of them ended up in jail. And as somebody said, the Caribbean case, the classic case of Clico where a lot, up to today, is not resolved, and that's all over the Caribbean, a lot of, a similar thing, a lot of people who had retired and invested their money, lost their money, right? Sorry? Right, and that was about 20 or so many years? Right, BCCI, not a financial institution, but folks, it happens all over the world in all countries especially in financial institutions where people invest their money to think they will get good return, but the senior people steal. You understand what we're saying here? So what would you do if you were a senior manager in one of these companies? Would you speak out against it? Or would you, I didn't see, I didn't hear, I have nothing to say. Some people do that. They just don't get involved. They, they turn a blind eye, and they, when they see it happening, they just look the other way. And they're saying you might be just as guilty as them, actually. So there are very, a lot of dishonest leaders in businesses. And that's where you need to determine what's the moral stand. And we are saying companies in hiring people, then you need not only to look at the technical matters, you need to look at the social matters. So the other issue then, folks, would be when you are running a business, and you realize the physical conditions are not totally adequate for staff, don't you have a moral responsibility to find money to make it right? That's the question. You understand if it is if the, 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 um, the environmental conditions are poor, the, the cooling system is not working well, right? Um, there's the presence of mold or even high stress environments, don't you have a responsibility, a moral responsibility to ensure that your staff don't work under high stress situations or work under harassment where they're being, you know, people are being harassed, they're being threatened, they're being bullied on the job. But a lot of it happens for, throughout the Caribbean, but nobody does anything really, you see. There's a lot of bullying in the workplace, a lot of harassment in the workplace, and, without, and people get away without consequences, right? Um, a lot of women more so, I believe, they tell me now that men are being harassed also, but a lot of women are actually harassed on the job and they're made, they're being forced to do favors, sexual and other favors, and we are saying, so it's not just about running a business, it is about making sure that you morally protect your staff, whether male, female staff, right? Um, and whether you have people who have their own gender orientation, whether they're trans um, transgender, whether they're transsexual, whether they're homosexual, you also have a, a responsibility to protect those people too, who have chosen, you know, this is the gender I think I am, right? For, and, and you need to protect those people also from discrimination. Um, so these are some of the, as we said, the moral issues, right? These are some of the moral issues that many organizations did not confront in past, but we're saying today, it is not only about business, 
It is about the people who work in your business and the values that your organization will support to, to make them feel well. So there are three levels of, of um, ethics. There are three levels of ethics. One, you have the domain of certified law. Two, the domain of ethics, the social standard. And three, the free choice. So we have been talking about the middle one, the social standard, that we are saying there are some values that we hold dearly in our society that should not be compromised. The domain of free choice is everybody does what they like. So the domain of free choice could be persons who determine for themselves, if I take something from a rich business person, I haven't done anything wrong. They are not losing anything. The domain of certified law is where the law prescribes that particular action should be taken. So you only follow the law. But you know the thing about the law, folks? The law is broken very regularly in that people still commit murder, people still commit manslaughter, people around the world still steal from people, even though the laws are there. Some countries have laws that you will get the death penalty, but people still break the law and they get the death penalty. So the law in itself doesn't stop people from behaving in particular ways. People still it on cell phones. Oh my gosh, boy, listen. Yeah, the law doesn't stop anything. People still break the speed limit. <laughs> right? People still break the speed limit. Well, my son this morning had to carry my car to get it serviced, and he's coming down. Stop at the stoplight, and the first thing he do, I say, Sonny, it didn't it say that you should not be using the phone in whatever ways. It's not only about talking. Get out that habit. And the earth for him, it pop, is at the stoplight, you see? But I said, well, unless you want to pay, I said, unless you want to pay $2,000, not me. <laughs> unless you want to pay $2,000, you better get that habit of, of reading these messages when you stop. Yeah, you got you to gotta stop that. And it's $2,000 right here, understand? Or, or six months in jail. Yeah, I think that's the penalty. <laughs> and or. Wow. So you can actually get jail yeah. Yeah. if the judge wants to. Wow. Sir, it has to be like that. Yeah. Wow. You're serious? <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. organizations can actually help us establish the social standard? What in organizations seek to establish an ethical position? What do organizations do to ensure they establish ethical positions? Sorry? But what do they do? Policy is it, it, something? No. Well, the vision and mission could. There's another, there's something else that they do and it's very popular nowadays. That comes down the road. 
When I talk strategically, what do they do strategically? Value statements. Companies will have their corporate values or value statements. So the value statement might say, our company is committed to honesty, integrity, fair play, respect for individuals. So, the, so, these, so, so no, a lot of companies, there are words, but these value statements or corporate values are intended to establish the social standard. Mm -hmm. That when you work here, we only employ people who are honest, who have integrity. That's what it's supposed to be. You know, ideally, but we know it is very difficult to determine when you hire somebody that they are really honest, that they're people of integrity, they like fairness, right? It is easy to do, yes, Gary? Right. right. So what they do, they use what you're saying, psychometric tests, right? So they use these psychometric tests, and if they, they ask some psychometric tests actually try to, well, they're actually developed by psychologists, and they assess your, your level of honesty, right? So if, um, and what you said, Gary, is what they do, they have questions worded, the same question worded differently about six or seven times and, and multiple times so if you are trying to say something that is not you for you to remember 30 something questions repeated seven times each you've got to be a genius so after a while if you're not honest you get mixed up and the report would actually flag those and it so i used to use them years ago when it was in consulting so the report actually flags people who tried to cheat the system who tried to lie to present an image that wasn't there, and it says whether you're the, they wouldn't say dishonesty, they say, but you're, I forgot the name that they use, but it's basically saying that your responses were inconsistent, suggesting that you attempted to cheat the system, right? And it actually comes in the report that says, and they would have highlight the areas where you were trying to really mislead, and saying you're trying to mislead because, as they said, if you, if, you're, if you answer three questions in one way and another four totally different, and you do that for many questions, there's a reason to flag it to say you're not really being honest. But if you know, if you are being honest, once it is repeated, you will say the same thing because you know this is a common position. But if you're lying, after a while you get confused, but what did I say four, four questions ago? And you're trying to remember what you say, and after a while, I mean 30 something questions repeated seven times for each, yeah, you gotta be a real you gotta be a real genius to remember how much you were lying throughout. And it really catches you. And once it flags you, the employers basically do not even shortlist you. They just uh, let's find somebody else. Right? Um, you might just have a bad maybe you're not drinking the night and you weren't a bit coherent. But you don't get the benefit of the doubt. Right? So I tell people when you do this kind of psychometric test, just be honest. Don't try to project this image of you that you're not. Just tr just be honest and answer how you really are. And don't try to project this false image that you think the company would want. Right? Because it's going to show up in the psychometrics. You see? No. Well, what if it, I, And there's a reason why that would happen because even the designers of those kind of assessments say that it should only account for maybe about 30 or 40 percent of a final decision, which means that you should still do interviews and reference checks, right? So you should not leave it to that alone, right? Because the honesty assessment is just one thing, but there are many other things that they seek to assess, right? Um, and somebody might just be lucky that they try to beat it and they might just beat the system and try to project some other image of it. But it should, and I know some companies use it as the majority tool to make a decision, but the, but the designers that they stress often say you misuse those tools if they become the majority reason why you make a decision. You still have to use other things.
we spoke about the ethical dilemma, so I don't need to go over that one. So you, you would have conflict both then related to the individual versus the organization, or the organization versus society, right? So you could have situations in which there is an organization really polluting the environment, right? Suppose in countries where you have mining companies and they're mining for, for um, you know, iron and other ore, if you pump a lot of the negative byproducts into, say, rivers and into waterways, you're really damaging you're opening a lot of people to harm and danger, polluting the water system. But some companies, really massive countries, where you are hundreds of miles up in a forest pumping, you're pumping it into the river upstream or into waterways. Now, the immediate effect might not be where you are, but downstream, you're really actually creating problems. So that's what we're talking about, um, looking at ethical issues about the organization wanting their profit and actually might having to harm the society, and then individuals and organizations really um, doing things that either facilitate an organization that not only makes profit, but you actually treat people the way they should be treated, versus organizations, uh, where individuals, sorry, um, that really care about people, and they will do things to make sure that people are protected and not harmed within the organizational context. So I would urge you to spend some time. There's a lot written on it, folks. Look for some reputable um, sites, the universities, database. There's a lot written about corporate social responsibility, good governance. Um, so we want you can spend some time looking at that area, reading up on it, as one of the areas that is likely to come out 